Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely official, Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Yeah, my day all going with you. Oh man, been a it's, it's been a rainy day outside today. Extremely. Huh? Say, man, we're on Boss Talk 101, man, and sometimes we have uh, people to come in that I feel very strongly about when the conversation starts because I know that people are about to get something, some help, some healing. Um, we got Reverend Gary Nelson here today. Mr. Gary Nelson here today. Brother Gary Nelson here today. What's going on, brother? Oh, it's going good. It's going good. Going good? Yes, sir. Man, it's good to have you, man. So uh, just thank you for coming on the show, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, just, um, you know, being out of Longview, Texas, man, from a young age, man, because I like to go all the way back. I don't like to start. That's why I told you if you don't want me to ask, because I'm going all the way to the woods when you know yes, sir. when they were, when it was really you know outhouses almost back in those days. I'm trying to get yes, all sir. the way back so we can come up. Yes, sir. Yeah. Already. Already. So just give us a little bit about yourself. Oh uh, man, I was um, country boy, and uh, there you go. Born in a family of uh, about seven boys and four girls. Seven and, boys and four girls. Yeah, we um, kind of shuffled around a little bit. Moved to Houston in my young age. Uh, we stayed up there a couple of years from the time that I was in the first and second grade. By the third grade, we had moved back to Longview. And kind of hard on us coming up a little bit, you know. Uh, but... You know, we made it. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We made it. And by the time I was 14, I lost my dad. And okay, at 14? At 14, yeah. How was that? How was that growing up without a father from 14 on up? <sighs> That's kind of when my life Kind of spiraled out of control a little bit? Went to spiraling out of control, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because my mama, uh, my mom was more likely, she... She really wasn't. She really, really isn't, because she still lives today at eighty three. I want to thank, wow. thank God. What's her name? Her name is Mary. Shout out, Miss Mary. How you doing, sweetheart? Yes, you got sir. a you got a great son here. Yes, sir. But uh, she didn't have a. She really wasn't stern. So I was able to. I I thought I was getting away by telling her this and telling her that, and she would believe this and that. And my dad was the one kind of had the stern hand. So when he when he passed away, that's when. Things went to spiraling downhill, and I went to sneaking, smoking, and we was we had a little corner store up the street, and we would steal the cigarettes and and steal the you know go and catch the man at the front of the store, and we go to the back and steal. Is that long, in Longview? Yes, in Longview, and we'd steal the quarts of beer. But and 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 now that I am where I am today, I can say that you know all that that I thought I was doing to the man. I was doing to myself. Amen. You know, so, you know, getting away with that. And when I was lied to my mom about not going to school, I thought I was getting away with that. And now that I am where I am today, I saw that, I see that I was doing that to myself. I didn't understand and realize how important an education would be. Mm -hmm. And when I could get it for free, I, would, I wouldn't get it for free. I would I tell people all the time, I said, man, if my mom would have replaced every part that I told her was hurting on my body on the morning that it was to go to school, I'd have a brand new overhaul mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even with that and dropping out of high school by the age of 16, that's when I started smoking marijuana. Okay, and, okay. You was, and, it was called reefer back then. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was in joints. In joints, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tell them, them, them old yellow wrapping papers. <laughs> yes, you know right. what I'm talking about. Yeah. The ones that you take them. I, I still probably can roll. And it, <laughs> it still, it, it, it had that uh, name to it. They had Cess and yeah, Bo yeah, and, yeah. Cess Bo. Yeah, yeah. They didn't call it Reggie back then. No, no, it wasn't no, no Reggie. No, no, they'll call it Skunk. Yeah, that's right. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's how they did it back then. So when I, as I went to uh, um, doing all these things and. 
and and I and as I learned now, that's all the enemy needs is a way to get in. Mm-hmm. And I had invited him in my life. Yeah. And yeah. Then he was able to talk me into other things, and yeah, that's when. Um, so you, so let's uh, let, let me see. Uh, you you had brothers. What were they doing during the time when you was out there smoking your your joints? Well, and 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 and, and sometimes I, I I talk about that because. Out of out of the seven boys, I've got one brother that's older, that's younger than I am. Out of the eleven kids, I'm number nine, so I'm only older than two si- okay. uh, siblings. Is that the two two guys? One guy older than you, and one girl. I, I'm older than one. I'm um, I'm older than one girl and one guy. Okay, everybody else is older than You're me. Right. I've got nine brothers and sisters older than I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or eight anyway. But um, I had one little young brother that 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 was three years old when my father passed and I was I was fourteen. So yeah. I'm like twelve years older than, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. than him. That's my younger brother Gabe. But Shout out Gabe. As I um as I looked at my life with Gabe, I tried to treat him in a way that I felt that my older brothers should have treated me. Mm-hmm. But because they was in a life of addiction and and had a stronghold over their life, they didn't know how to treat my life and see as I have learned that those of us who are spiritual beings has got to realize that we are living through a spiritual warfare Mm -hmm. and there is always something that's trying to bound us down from exceeding to the purpose that God had really created us to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your brother, he, um, he, 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 he looked up to you quite naturally, right? With that big of a span between, the, how was your influence on him? Was it good? Was it bad? Well, it was good, and 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 when it came to me and Gabe, even though I had started smoking marijuana and stuff, I didn't try to live a life to influence Gabe to do that. Okay, you tried to keep him shelter, shelter, shun him away from it, shun him away yeah. from it. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, my brothers that embrace me in it. We was always in conflict about the way that I treated, treated him. Gabe, the way that I treated Gabe, yeah, and the way that I treated Gabe should have been the way that they treated me. Yeah. When, when I walked into their circle as a 15, 16 year old boy, okay, as I look at it now, they should to they should have pushed me away and told me, "No, man, Dad's dead. You're gonna continue to mind, Mama." And, but they didn't. They embraced me, yeah, yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Well, it had to be a tough time for all y'all. That, that's just, that's a dysfunctionality that steps in that, you know, at that point, the whole, your world changed. The, your family's world changed. Right. When you lose your father, I couldn't imagine losing my father at that age. I lost my mother at an early age, but to lose at 14 and to feel like you had that, that backing, I know it had to be tough on the whole fi- family, the entire family. Right, right, to a certain extent. To a certain because, extent. Because he really was the head, you know. Correct. Uh, I don't care how old you was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Daddy was the man. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Daddy was the God that you knew. Yes, during that yes, time. and it, exactly. So as I looked at it as um, not blaming my brothers for anything about my addiction and what had happened, but I do look back at life and wish they would have been a little more harder on yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a little more stern on yeah. me. And then even after my, I got stronger in my addiction, I kind of shunned away from my brothers and latched on to other friends in the street, and that's when my addiction to crack cocaine. Yeah, so so the brothers never did crack. Yes, they did too. I, yes, yes. Because this was in was this what was eighty something eighty five ninety yes eighty six eighty seven yes the early about eighty five rounding there yeah I yeah. was running through there back then yeah yeah not as much but I used to come up there yeah yeah I definitely know the area so that's when the the the, the crack cocaine kind of came in yeah. but I just didn't hang out with my brothers and do it you know they just had their own thing but I had kind of fell over into the trap and. I just kind of shunned away from them and and went to doing my um went to doing my own thing, but I still kind of tried to hold a a responsible life because I worked a little bit, you know. Even in my addiction, I worked and uh, I worked for a while, and I had a little accident at, at uh, uh, just speeding up a little bit around the age of twenty one, and yeah, I, I got a whole. So you started smoking crack in high high early living age, about eighteen. Eighteen, yeah. That's kind of wow. Yeah, because usually I remember 
being one that was in the environment that you didn't, it was the younger ones wasn't, if, if they done it, they were hiding it like ever because yeah. they were, it wasn't as hard on them as it was the older or people, you know. And then it was an older friend that I had went to run. There it is. Running there it is. With. See, see, there it is, right there. Yeah, yeah. And 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 he introduced it to me in a in a in a in a, it in was, a joint in a joint a primo a primo. I know exactly what you're talking about. And he didn't tell me what it was, but I got to admit no, to didn't. this day, I liked it. DMX got the same I was story just about that you to had. Say, I was just That's about the same to say, thing DMX he said, said the exactly thing. like he said. Yeah, yeah. That he was introduced to it by an older. Family member or, or a cousin, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, the devil is working in that whole entire situation. In that whole entire situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. That whole thing has got a whole, a whole mesmerizing state from uh, uh, Satan himself. Yes, staple. Yes, yes. So when he introduced it to me, I liked it, and and man, I couldn't wait to get off work every day. Do it again. I, to do it again. To smoke it again. But he did tell me one thing. He they 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 had they, they called me a nickname that, that one that just kind of stuck with me all of my life. My, my name is Gary, but to everybody, I've always been Tab. Tab, so, okay. Tab, yeah. So he would he told me he said Tab, man, let me tell you, we smoking this, and I see you like it. He said, but don't you never mess with that pipe, man. Don't don't never. I said, man, I ain't gonna never mess with that pipe. But that's like. That's like telling the devil that you're not gonna do it and he's already he in. already in control. He's already in control. So, and that's what steered me away from this particular friend because really, if he ever smoked the pipe, I never saw him smoke it. All he ever did was smoke primos, but man, the way he loaded them primos up, it was like smoking a pipe. Yeah, 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 you he know? had, he had and, that, and that's what drove me to the desire to wanna see what else. The was, next level. The next level. Yeah, there's levels to it. Yes. Sir. So that's when you you left him because he wouldn't go and graduate with you. That's right. And you moved over to somebody who was doing bigger things. Doing bigger things. I get it. Oh man, that's why. No, no, no. I get it. <laughs> I get it because uh, this yeah. is something that the devil does. That's you know? what he does. Uh, he come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's right. So basically, what happens is now he's pretty much going to isolate you because he isolates you first. That's right. He is always isolated from the jump. He that, never do it, you know what I mean, in a place where you with a lot of friends anyway. There's an isolation mentally That's right. that he's using against you the whole entire time. Uh -huh. Even though you was with your friend, that was an isolated moment for you to even think to go to someone else. Isolation is the way that the, the devil attacks you. That's right. So he once he gets you in a corner, then he moves you how he wants to. He then maneuvers you the way he needs he to. He did that. Yeah. And he started me to smoking. They were smoking it out of the bowl first. And you know, they had some kind of little old bowl way they do it. And man, that dope, that. Uh, uh, out of a bowl, you. It, it was a, they didn't, it, 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 it was like a, it's a bowl. You, you put the crack on the top of the bowl. Okay. And they have like uh, some kind of rum or something in okay. the bottom of the bowl. Okay. And, oh, it was just all set up. And so, you, when you got there, you like, man, this here is different. Uh, yeah. When they, when, they, when they do it, it, it's so pretty when the, when, the, when the smoke go down in the bowl and it just light up. And yeah, it just, yeah, 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 yeah. And, oh, and it was like, wow. And, man, you suck that demon right down, down your, your throat. throat. And then did y'all use cans, too? But wait a minute, that was the first, we just said it was different phases. Yeah, 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 that, okay. That okay. was the first phase. And okay. even that phase there, you were still able to be level and maintain. Okay. And when it came to the straight shooter okay. and the can, okay, that, the straight was, shooter. that was a different phase. Okay, yeah, you, you okay, I got you, so... So and yeah, the, yeah, and I know you you about to go into detail. Yes, even with the straight shooter, <laughs> they I have met people. I met people, man, that used to embarrass me to the to the max. That I would meet people, and they said, "Oh, you tab, you the fall guy," and I the said, "Fall the, guy, the fall guy." What does that because mean? Because I taught people how to make disposable straight shooters out of fall. Oh, foil. foil guy. Foil, yes. You knew how to make them out of foil. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's something because, yeah. I, see, yeah. because that's what, see, in my Bible-based recovery class, I say it's cunning, it's baffling, and it's powerful. But that's the devil. Yeah. He's cunning, he's baffling, and he's powerful. 
So he was so cunning that you ain't got time to go smoke or, or go find or buy you a straight shooter. Here, I got you an idea. I'm going to show you how to make it. You don't you. even need to go nowhere. You it's right here in the kitchen. It's right here in the kitchen. Yeah. So Are you, you with us? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you just get your you just get your your your, your char bar and you ball it up yeah. where it won't stick. Char bar. Did y'all get that part? Char bar. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, char. That's that stuff that you got in the kitchen that you used to scrape the, the, the that old cash down skillet out. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna put y'all there today. You take that char the char boy, that remember the little puffy scrunchy little metal thing that you scraped the skillet out with. Yeah. They would take that, stick it in a a a a. a, a Straight. Foil, you stick it in an antenna, you stick it wherever you could stick it to kind of, yeah, it was like a muffler. Uh, that's right. There it is. There it is. I don't know much about it, guys. There it is, but you you, <laughs> you, you, you ball it up because you didn't want it to stick too many holes through your foil. And you would roll that up, and, and that's how you would smoke it. But the only bad thing about the foil was you didn't get to push it. And a lot of people told yeah. me, "Say, man, you 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 losing lose, it. You lose a lot of dope on that fall, man." And and I tell them, I said, "Well, maybe you know, here I am. I'm thinking that I'm not getting di- addicted to yeah, it, yeah, yeah, because I'm smoking it this way. But it's costing me to spend more, more money, more money, yeah, because I'm only getting one fix out of that, and then I have to keep going on and on. Yeah, the more boys down there were happy when you did that. Yes, man. The more boys, there was some boys down there back in the day." <laughs> Uh, but, shout out to them Davenport boys, oh, all of them. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Hey, man, I'm, I know about everything. You can't everything you could ever think of. <laughs> yeah. I'm over here like, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I remember them, those days, man. Yeah, those Davenport boys. They yeah, had, a lot of them they died, and one of them locked up or yeah. something. Well, he's he doesn't come home. He come home. Yeah, he okay. Come shout home out to now. them Davenport yeah. boys. Were twin yeah. boys were they twins? Well, no. They were, they were close in age. They were close in age. Y'all. And the daddy too. They had that car lot. He passed away. Didn't yeah, he? the daddy. That the daddy passed away. I think it's one of them that's home now. I, I uh, vaguely, I don't know if his name is. I don't remember his name actually. Well, I, I just remember running into him. I was uh, I was around down there. Yeah, time. yeah. But uh, man, and it just kept getting worser and worser and worser till it just led you, it uh, sex and drugs and I was married and it just it tore your family apart. Tore my family down. Wow, how many kids? When my addiction first started, I had one son. And uh, I kind of went on a, a break there for a minute, and we had another son. But our sons are 16 years apart. Wow. Right now, I've and got the a, same mom. Same mom. Right now, I've got a son, 32, and one, 16. Okay, did she at any point condone the things you were doing? Was she a part with you? Yes. Had to be. Yes, because when... Are y'all still together? Yes. Praise God. 35 years. That, yeah. see, see what I'm saying? God will clean it up. Man. God will clean it up. It, it's kind of like the story. When you were first talking, it was more to me, and I'm not going to go into it too much, but it was almost like when you started explaining your brother, your smaller brother, I would think about Benjamin and Joseph and the relationship that they had. Right. And then I would think about how that relationship was stripped apart when he had to go through and he was sold by his other brothers and all that other good stuff. And, and you know, and then when they channeled back together, it was he still was concerned about Benjamin. Right. You know, it, so so I kind of was feeling that way, but it wasn't all the way connecting for me. Yes. But it is just showing a lot of family members and what families go through. Right. But God has an intended plan that he'll make it right. That, he, that he'll make it right. That's, that's what matters. And even in the... First part of my addiction, just backing up a little bit when I, when I first met my my wife, yeah. she and I was smoking marijuana. But she was smoking marijuana with me, and when I started smoking the Primos, I introduced her. Wow! To, I introduced them to her. Wow! And she started smoking smoking Primos with me. She even smoked the pipe with me. Wow! And what's so funny is now y'all clean together. Yes. That's, yes, but she's I mean? been she's been clean a whole lot, a lot longer. longer than you. Yes, uh, so she started the, that that journey first, and then she tried to introduce you to it, or you found it yourself. I found it my when I found it. I in the because she and I was just hanging out together. You know, we was we was we, we started out as friends. You know, and it just kind of excelled from that. But we just we just hung out a lot together, and we smoked marijuana together, and 
when and she lived right next door to me. Wow. I'm talking about the clean part, though. <laughs> oh. Being clean. Because you said she was clean a lot longer than you were, so I'm wondering... Did that channel you, did to, that clean, channel clean you to be clean as well? No. No, not no, at all. No, no. And uh, uh, because I... Even in, after she got clean, I abused the house. I abused the respect for her and everything with my drug life. Because at at that particular time, the house was mine. You know, back to the part, just backing up a little bit. As okay. when I was when I was working, I I had land. I was uh, I was a uh, uh, the um, the head of the wash rack. I was working for the brew pony act there in Longview and. I was gone one morning in one of the cars, and I had a car accident with the Longview Cable Company, and that's how I ended up with a bunch of money. Wow. So I was about 21 then, but I, like I said, I always tried to have my head on straight. So in taking all that, instead of taking all that money and blowing it on drugs, which I did blow all right smart of it on, blo- you on bought drugs, a home. You bought a I, house. Bought, I bought a house. So when I bought the house, I remodeled the house, but, but by this time, uh, when I bought the house, Jennifer and I already had had a son, though. So with just backing up, she she and I had already been smoking. Uh, I had already introduced her to crack by then because through the guy that introduced me to the primos, because she and I used to smoke marijuana together all the time. So I kind of done her just like he done me. Yeah, you put I went, a little bit in there later. Yes, I, yeah. I told her, I said, I got a surprise for you tonight. So I went over her house and... I fired up the joint and we fired it up and just like I did, you know, it, it, it was it's a, it was a whole lot different from the time that I quit than than the time that I started from the quality of the crack. Yeah, of the, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Up from, yeah, it disintegrated, didn't it? Yes, but she liked it as well. So for a couple of few years, we smoked it together and 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 and, and even got to the point to where she smoked the pipe together. But I believe that at, after it got to the to to our oldest son probably being a, like four five years old she quit just quit cold turkey she was through with it she didn't like what it had done to her life she didn't like what it had done to her job career but she had to quit um, during the times that she was pregnant wasn't didn't she or was she still on it while she was pregnant yes she did quit when we, she wasn't smoking it when we got when she was pregnant so she already had a mindset to that I could stop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's she, important. He's trying to think. He's I'm like, trying to he's think. He's like, oh, was she or wasn't she? No, she wasn't smoking it when she was pregnant. Oh, you remember if she had been. Maybe not. No, because no, he was smoking no. too. He was smoking yeah. too. She wasn't smoking when, when we was pregnant. But when she was pregnant. But when she quit smoking it, she, we still was together. Right. And she wasn't she wasn't smoking nothing, and and for a while, you know, we would go through. You and, would get, y'all would get frustrated with each other. Oh, and we would go through breakups. Six yeah. months, seven months, she'd leave, and she'd come back, and she'd leave, and she'd come back, and because you had the house, because I had the house, and through all that, within over a sixteen year period, I was still on drugs, in and, and and I believe you know. Sad to say that Tabastian was conceived uh, through my drug addiction. You know, I was probably still on. I ain't no probably to it. I was on drugs when when he was conceived, but she wasn't mm-hmm. at the time. And, mm-hmm. But man, if you saw him, <laughs> God, he's a truly healthy boy. He's bigger than he's big. He's, wow. he's bigger and taller than me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I'm hoping. Won't he do it? Uh, yeah. So I'm hoping that he continue to. Stay in football and keep. Oh, he he likes to play football. Yeah, he plays. Just for, a sixteen year old. Yeah, he plays for the Longview Lobos. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, what position he playing in over there? He's a center. Center. He, good at. Yeah, he's good at. He's that. a big boy. Yeah, he's he's, he's a, a big boy. He ain't no little boy. He's a he's a he's a pretty big boy, but at the age of two years old, I, up when Sebastian was two, and I was still in my drug addiction, really, really, really bad. And uh, Tabastian, uh, the, Tabastian, I think he went in his brother's bedroom because at that age, Tabastian ate paper. Wow. And his, his brother's bedroom was just full of stuff. And okay. It was kind of a cold time of the year, and he was in that bedroom, and 
I wanted to walk up my mother's that morning, and I go and I be when you go to looking for him, he'd be hiding somewhere eating paper. And we took him to the doctor for that, and the doctor said that it was something in the paper that his body needed, that he could smell it in the paper. And and he said whenever his body get whatever it needs, he'll quit eating paper. Wow. And truly that happened, but what can I say? That you know why he ate paper and he had a dad that was addicted to drugs, you know, yeah. didn't know what was going on with mm-hmm, his body, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and then that kind of had my mind puzzled. Made you think about it. But it still didn't stop my addiction. Correct. You know, and that was selfish of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even, and, and I'm seeing my son go through something and it could be what he's going through is because that I was smoking crack when I conceived him, but I, we take him to the doctor, but it didn't stop me from smoking drugs. Exactly. So uh, he was in the bedroom one morning, and we went up the road. And when we went up the road, my brother looked back down the road. We was up to my mom's house, and the house was on fire. Wow! And I go back down there, and, and it was the bed, and okay. it was the bedroom where Sebastian was. So I, I, I figured that he must have knocked the electric heater over and stuff. So um, after the house caught on fire, and we had to move out and get into an apartment. And the insurance company gave my wife, we we got the insurance check for the house. The house wasn't total, so we got money to remodel the house. Okay. When we got the money to remodel the house, I went to going through that money because uh-huh. it was my house. Exactly. And I was on drugs, and I went to smoking up that money. And it was in the middle of the night one night, and she told me that um, there would be no more of this. She said, Tab, I'm not going to raise another son in a drug-addicted house. Like, uh, I'm not going to raise Sebastian in the same environment that Gary was raised in. Okay. So she said, I'm going to let you go back over there to your house. She said, I am the mother of your kids, and I could take you for everything, but I'm going to just take the money and make a life for me and the kids, and I'm going to go on. So... We departed at that particular time, and this was the... What year was that? This was uh, 2006. Wow. This was our longest breakup ever because... How long did it last? Five years. Wow. This was the longest. We had broke up over the years for six months to seven months, and you know, but never a year apart. And even in our breaking up, her mom was living then, and she would go back to living with her mama, but... I would be able to go over and see Gary. It wasn't really, but this time here it was different. She, she was just fed up. Yeah, she was more stern with. I'm gonna go ahead and let this go. Let this go. So after that, I, you know, I was still in my addiction, but I got a job. I was remodeling houses, and when you remodeling houses, you, you tear out good stuff, and 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 it was I was able to get stuff to bring home to work on my yeah, house yeah, without yeah. buying it. So I was steady putting the house together, living on a utility pole, living up in the burnt house, and but I was still in my addiction. Yeah, yeah. So Jennifer come to me one day and she tells me, she said, Well, obviously she was out of money and they was living in an apartment. She said, I'm pissing to get a loan and I need this house. I need somewhere to raise these kids at this time, five years done passed. Gary's old enough, he's done went to having kids and They all scrunched up in an apartment. I have a sister who lives here in Dallas, and I asked for her advice. And I said, well, she wants the house now. What do you think I should do? And she said, well, you uh, said the house was for your kids and your wife. So I moved out, not only giving her the house, but I even put it in her name. Yeah. But it really wasn't it really wasn't no more my house than it was was for hers from the beginning because she's my wife. But I put it in her name, and I moved here to Dallas with my sister. And when I moved to Dallas, my addiction kind of broke some, but it really wasn't. It wasn't as stern as it was when I was in Longview, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't as serious because I was in an unfamiliar place, so I couldn't get it as much as I wanted to. But as I worked... I'd catch the bus to Longview sometime and spend the weekend down yeah, there. having a good time. Get high the whole weekend and stuff like that. And so that kind of went on for a while. And by the time Sebastian was seven, Jennifer invited me back to come home to Longview. Uh, he called me one night and he said, Dad, my mom said she needs you to come to the house. 
and clean this swimming pool out for us. You know, <laughs> I had a swimming pool in the backyard at the time. We've taken taking it out now. Pretty, it was an above ground pool, but I worked for the pool company, so a, yeah. a friend and I took above, above ground and put it in the in ground. The ground. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and it was a pretty nice pool. So I went home and I fixed the pool up and end up staying around a while. Mm-hmm. Well, now I'm back in Longview. Wow. It's turn up time. Them old friends, they still out there. Yes, bro. They happy to see you just like she is. <laughs> and I turn it up. Turn all the way up. All the way up. Well, it wasn't three years then I was on my way to prison. Okay. Because I had got really deep in my addiction, man, and I was going to Lowe's and Home Depot's and places like that. Scamming. Oh, man. Doing things that I thought I'd never do. Yeah. I would. I was stealing. Picking from, up a whole pickup truck for Stealing us. from people's yards and just, but it was by the grace of God that I'm alive today. You know, just yeah, you walking. Didn't get shot. That somebody walk, didn't Walking shoot up you. in somebody's yard, taking stuff, man. It was, it, it was out of control. I'm mm-hmm. talking about. The, I, I feel sorry, and that's why I take a delight in teaching the the, the Bible based recovery class because I I try to tell people that it I I wouldn't desire to see nobody go through. How long did you stay incarcerated? What I went through, I stayed incarcerated two years, two and, years ten, and ten, ten months. months. Okay, I um, but when I got locked up in the county jail, I knew that it was time for my change, man, and I was uh. I was 47 at the time. I'm 53 now. And I looked in, I had, after I slept for a couple of days and I went and looked in the mirror, man, and my hair had grown out on my face. And I said, man, God, I'm an old man, you know, and I have allowed myself to come to this point somewhere I thought I'd never go. I had been in and out of jail before, but it was for tickets. I, you know, it, and when I was in my addiction, you get a ticket, I didn't pay it. That was back when you could lay a ticket out overnight. And But that was the only thing I had ever been to jail for. This mm-hmm. was serious. But I was so into my addiction, bro, I forgot that I had, I was already facing state jail time for shoplifting at a uh, 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 Kmart and got caught. Now I had I it didn't even register. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't even remember when they got me out of there. And I just I just was steady running. Wow. So when I got into jail, man, and I fell on my knees and I talked to the Lord and I told Him, I said, Lord, if you could help me get out of this, Lord, I would give my life to you and I would change and be a better person. And my sister here in Dallas. I wrote her and told her about what was happening, what was going on, and I, I make her laugh sometimes. And when, the sister that you're talking about, is this your younger sister or your older sister? This is my older sister. Now, she's okay. not a part of the 11, but she's my sister. She's my daddy. Oh, she's okay. my dad's oldest daughter. Okay. Okay. And when I received her letter in jail, you know, because when we was kids, with her being the oldest, she always patted us and just... You know, like a mom. Yes. So when I received her letter in jail, I just cried and oh man, I cried big time before I opened the letter because I know she's finna pat me. Mm-hmm. And I make her laugh when I tell her when I opened the letter and it said, "Take your medicine. This is good for you." <laughs> and I wiped my eyes because it it wasn't funny. You know, I, it was hard. You know, she. She got stern with me. Yeah, yeah. And then it it dried my tears up. I'm like, what is she saying? She was letting me know that what you're fixing to go through is going to be good for you. Right. She said, take your medicine. In other words, God chastens the one that he loves. That he loves, man. And Mm -hmm. out of all I went through, I knew that it had to be God. So even within that, my wife would come up every every two days. every twice a week at the jail to see me. And last time that she came, we had a little argument. She had brought my mom up there with with her to see me. And we had an argument, and, and I kind of lashed out at her, and I just turned my back on her and left out of the thing. Mm-hmm. But even when I left there and got to a prison, she wrote me for a couple of times and sent me some money a couple of times. Wow. 
and I was kind of depending on that and depending on her and, and depending on them letters, but God had a plan for me and I had made a promise to the Lord. And all of a sudden my wife just quit writing mm. and I would write no answer and I would write and no answer. And that went to reminding me of when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. He had, he hardened her heart for her to turn her back on me. And when she turned her back on me, that even made me seek God's face even more. more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And man, I would have dreams about smoking crack every night. I would dream about it. Wow. And I would just, I would kept on praying and asking the Lord to deliver me from this and deliver me from this. And I would wake up in the the next morning after I'd dreamed about it, and it was almost like I was angry with God. I said, Lord, I asked you to take it away from me, and you didn't take it away from me. And and I'd go to bed, and it didn't happen for like a week. And one day I was out on the wreck yard. And I was walking around the yard and something just clearly come to me just like I'm talking to you and it says, what did you dream about last night? And I thought for you a minute. You didn't dream about anything. And it wasn't there. Wow. Man, and they thought I was crazy. And I went to praising the Lord right there on the red yard because wow. I knew that I had been delivered. It just asked me clearly just like I'm talking. It said, what did you dream about last night? That's a blessing. That's God. And I thought, and I, I said, and man, I just went to praising the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Man, it was the best feeling that you could ever have in your life. I was delivered. I was completely delivered, and I was, man, and I tell you, there in prison, I was set free. And that's when I ran into the man that I teach the Bible-based recovery program through, and he was teaching Bible-based recovery, and I was an addict. What was his name? His name is Pastor Dan Lund. Dan Lund. Shout out Dan Lund for doing what he supposed to do down there. Yes. As, was he a chaplain? No, he was just a— Just he, a guy to come down just there? Just a guy to come in the prison. All right. And he's teaching recovery out of a recovery Bible. I didn't bring one of my Bibles with me, but— and what's so good about this recovery Bible, you can get sobriety and salvation at, at the, the same, same time. time. And that's what my, my Bible-based recovery programs are based on, that the Bible tells us that a man that builds his house on sand mm -hmm. is a fool. That's because right. what are you going to do when the wind and the rain comes and the storm and the wind beat up against it? Your house shall fall. But if you build your sobriety on a solid foundation and build it on Jesus, when the devil come with his fiery darts and the wiles of the uh, temptation and the things that he come at you with, you got something to stand on. Mm. You got God to stand on. You got his strength to stand on. And that's what he have, what, that's what I have learned. Do I still have stinking thinking? Yes. Man, I'll be riding down the road sometime and I said, Lord. Where did that thought no, come no, no, from? No, no. I think that's something that everybody encounters. There's nobody in this room that don't have the same thing going. That, that's right. So, and I think a lot of times people just because they hide it a little better, you seem to think that there's something that they're not because you don't see it. It, it. You know what you're thinking, but you can't see into what their thoughts are. And they don't work broadcast it because you have a lot of people who are, whether preachers or just individuals, yeah. who will never say that I think of bad things sometimes. That's they will right. never mm -hmm. make it known. That's right. So, but we all do it. But to me, when that attacks you, you have to first recognize, oh, that's the devil. Right. You're not going to win today. You need to go on somewhere. In and the that's name really, of, And that's and really I, what let, it let is. Let me just say, um, also, the time when you was incarcerated and you, all, you, and you heard this voice, um, I'm quite sure that you were reading your word and, and doing things that where you were filling yourself up. A lot of times people don't realize it, but as you, when you get to a point where you're broken— and, and God starts to replenish you with the word. If you got something to put in there, yes. then it starts to fill you up. It's like a food. It's a nourishment spiritually. And, and that, so that's what happens. And you, you have to take so much until you can break the curse that the devil is using against you. You are so exactly right, brother. Yeah. Because that's exactly what, and that's why. You was reading your word. And that's why I tell you the part about how I would get so angry with God. Yeah, because yeah. I felt that I was doing he everything was right. He was reading. I'd get up and, and, and I still do that to this day. Amen. I, 
like coming here today, I got up at three. I got up at two four. When I got up, it was two forty eight this morning. Amen. I got up to find for the Lord to give me a message for the church today. Uh-huh. But in the when I'm just on a regular daily basis, I get up just like I was in prison. Yeah. Five o'clock every morning. Yeah. Give God the first part yeah. of my day. I haven't changed nothing from the day that He delivered and Amen. set me free. Amen. The same thing it took to get it is going to be the same thing it takes to, to keep, keep it. it. Amen. And that's where I was, and that's why I would get mad yeah. when I would dream about it. And I said, "Well, Lord, I'm because doing. Been I'm doing everything yeah. I'm supposed to do." And yeah. But you still had some things you had to let go, and and God. I believe in forgiveness and forgiving yourself. I'm not even talking about others. Right. Just forgiving yourself for what you've done to be in the situation you was in. Yes. You had to be able to do that. And when that truly happened, I believe that's when the whole bond is broken. Man, I don't know where you know that. No, no, no. I'm ready. That's pretty. I I promise you I'm ready. That's pretty deep. Because that was the hardest thing in the world for me to do. Forgiving yourself. To forgive myself. And I tell my pastor sometimes I still have struggles with that yeah. because I take it as a cop out yeah. because I know that I was wrong and I was wrong for the wrong that I done. And some people just, well, I forgive myself. Well, that's, mm. I, that was too easy for me. Oh, and God, man, God is so merciful. Wow. And that's what I had to learn that he loved me so much that I just didn't want it to be that easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I was I was wrong, Lord, and I I want to be punished. But He said, "I forgive His you." Grace. His but grace, but even is after sufficient. that, even after um, you forgave yourself or you went through all of that, did you actually go back to the people that you wronged and actually ask them for forgiveness as well? Yes, that is step eight in the class that yeah. I teach. Yeah. Step eight is make a list of all the persons people, yeah. you have harmed yeah. and become willing to make amends mm-hmm. to them all. And you can't go to everybody because if I did, I'd have to go to every house that I stole plants from. See, yeah. because that's what I did for a living. And, yeah. that's, and that's sad, I, you know, because yeah. I knew the plants. I could go take off of somebody's porch. I knew what it would, I knew what this plant would be worth because I deal with plants. Yeah. I dealt with yeah. them all my life. Yeah. So and that's what I do now. I'm a landscaper. Yeah. But and, and and so I would have to find every house that I ever went to in Longview and stole a plant off of. No, but no. that's some, but sometimes that can even be good because no, you no, never I know who you might touch behind that door that you knocking on. Exactly. Their door. But another thing is also a part of the process is writing it down and writing down the things you've done. That's right. There's so many different ways different that ways you of, dump yeah. that you tr- you have to get that off of you. And 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 I I think that that. And you, you know the process. And the word reads that God have mercy on a contrite spirit. Contrite. Contrite. Right. Contrite spirit. Because he knows that I can't go back to everybody, but he he knows my heart. He right. knows yeah. my right. feeling. Yeah. And he knows. And, and, and that's just like the part of forgiving yourself. Yeah. I was so remorseful and so hurt about after I just... After he took the blinders off, because it talks about it in First Corinthians four and four about how the enemy of the world have your eyes blinded, yeah, yeah, till you yeah, can't clearly yeah. see. So yeah. after my blinders was took off and I saw how wrong and how hate and selfish and just corrupt that I was, that even though that the forgiveness and the it was all free, that I didn't deserve it. Well, you know that's what David said once he had come to a realization of what had happened with him in second Samuel chapter 11 with Bathsheba. It's just something that basically you go through something sometimes. And after you, it's like you woke up and you realize all the stuff that you've done wasn't right. Yes. You couldn't see at first. You couldn't just see Just like it. when he got Uriah killed and all that stuff. He That's wasn't right. thinking about it. He was selfishly doing everything that he'd done. That's so right. So at that point, after he realized it, after Nathan came to him, then he was able to understand, understand. that, I, hey, I done this wrong. And and, and then he, that's where you see Psalms, I believe, 51, re- yeah. creating me a clean heart clean. and renew a right spirit in me. That's right. So this is the way that we feel after we go through a situation where we, we're beat down with the facts that we done something that we should have known better than doing. Right. And then God shows it to us. He opened our eyes up to it. And that's where you have to deal with it. And, and I think that's what... I think that that's why he left those examples for us. Right. And right. So we could see those things and understand. He says another thing in the Bible, uh, uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But how can you love your neighbor if you don't love yourself? If you don't love yourself. So that's the stuff that you have to kind of articulate and maneuver in so that you can so that you can be healed. That's right. That's right. And and, 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 and that goes a, a lot back to the steps in the in the recovery program. That the, and, and that's what it talks about. It teaches you healing. Mm-hmm. It teaches you the aspect, like step four said, 
uh, uh, take a searching and a fearless moral inventory of mm-hmm. yourself. Mm-hmm. That means they're going to be t- that's going to time times going to come up in your life where you want to condemn somebody else mm-hmm. or say something about somebody mm-hmm. else. But check yourself. Yeah, it's a sweep around your own front door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 these are the part. These are the things that lead you to. Forgiveness. These are the kind of things that break people don't believe yeah, it. Yeah. That break yeah. strongholds, strong break take down barriers mm-hmm. that the enemy they have put up against you. And until you break these things, just like you talked about about me being in the word, and and and, and it was to. Good. until you break these things, can't nothing get in. Well, see the thing. I that's the thing that I I really when I teach I teach about uh, reading. Like you, what got you delivered was really God being in you, right? His word being in you. Yes. Now this is the problem I have with a lot of things that go on in our modern day Protestant Christian churches and people who say they believe in God. A lot of time, the man, the men who have had these encounters, we have the word in us. Right. We have to find a way to get this into the people. That's right. And I think a lot of times, because of all of the bright lights and the stages and the pulpits and everything else. It gets lost in the sauce. I'm That's telling right. you now. That's right. We got to do better at getting the word off the pages and in the hearts of every individual Amen. in order to get them saved. Amen. And we're not doing a good enough job in that aspect. And, oh, man, that's so powerful. It's the truth. That's powerful. I that's, teach that way. That's powerful. Because I know it's not happening. And we let people off the hand handle by them not. They don't have to read. They just come here what we got to say. That's and right. And we sound eloquent. And, <laughs> w- and pe- with, with wisdom of words, we, and, and God give us it spiritually, but to them it's wisdom of words. But, right. But for us, it's an encounter we had with God to get this knowledge. That's right. And, and so they looking at it like it's a, oh, it's good. You know what I mean? But for us, we we had to get this to be delivered. That's right. And, and, I, and, and I get it. So I, I love your story. Yes, sir. And you got to go deep. You got to get it. It's got to get into you. 